cloud. All right, we are ready. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this webinar, Do We Want to Get Well? Healing What Divides Us. Thank you for joining this webcast and spending an hour with us today. This webinar is sponsored by Discipleship Ministries of the Church of the Brethren and the Anabaptist Disabilities Network. I'm Stan Duick, Director of Organizational Leadership and Co-Coordinator of Discipleship Ministries. Partnering with me today as host and webinar facilitator is Jean Davies. Jean is the Executive Director of the Anabaptist Disabilities Network. She carries responsibility for resources, advocacy, volunteer coordination, social media, administration, and development. She is an ordained minister, graduate of Bethany Theological Seminary, and pursuing a certificate in disability and ministry at Western Theological Seminary. Jean, thank you for co-sponsoring this event. Thank you, Stan. I'd like to introduce our speaker, Amy Julia Becker. Amy Julia is a writer and speaker on faith, family, disability, and privilege. Her writing has been published in USA Today, Christianity Today, The Washington Post, and The New York Times. She has spoken at conferences including the Festival of Faith and Writing and the Summer Institute on Theology and Disability, as well as many churches and schools. She has written four books, including White Picket Fences, Turning Toward Love in a World Divided by Privilege. Before Amy Julia begins, I invite you all to pray with me. Holy God, we are living in a stressful and tumultuous time. We invite your Holy Spirit in us and among us. Give us your peace. Be in our minds and in our thinking, our ears and in our listening, our mouths and in our speaking our hearts, and in our loving. In the name of Jesus, our healer and our hope, we pray. Amen. I just want to remind everyone that you can share questions and comments in the chat box, and uh, we may uh, uh, take some of those during Amy Julia's presentation, or we may hold them for the end. Welcome, Amy Julia. We are glad to hear what you have to share with us today. Thank you, Jean. Thank you, Stan. It's great to be here with you all. And I'm going to do the hardest part of my presentation, which is figuring out how to share my screen effectively. I think I've got it. Um, let's see. We're going to share and come over here and then present. Does that show up for you as a slide? Or is it about to? There we go. There it is. All right. Well, um, it's great to be here with you all today. Thank you for joining us um, for this time together. I'm here to talk about some of the themes of my book, White Picket Fences, Turning Towards Love in a World Divided by Privilege. And I'm going to talk in a minute a little bit about the word privilege and the various divides that we are experiencing in our nation, um, in our communities, in our families sometimes, and within our church communities specifically. Before I do that, I do want to just make, excuse me, make the point that we are living in a time of division that's just exploded, at least when it comes to headlines. We could argue that there have been social divisions throughout our American history and really throughout our human history. We can go back to Genesis and find out about the divisions that um, tore apart families and communities even then. And we can see it any day in the news, whether those are racial and ethnic divisions, political divisions, we've seen that in a, even a violent way in this past month in our history. Um, and in our country, we have also see that when it comes to dividing lines among people with, uh, who are able-bodied and disabled. We see that again in the headlines here. And I bring all that up just to say that this is where we are as a nation. And we're certainly aware of these divisions in a way that I'm not sure we have been, at least in my lifetime. They're in the headlines every day. They're affecting our families. They're affecting our mental health. They're affecting all sorts of systems within our country, whether that's healthcare or education, and they're affecting our church communities. 
And so for us as people of faith, it's not just a question of how can we acknowledge and understand these divisions, but also to ask the question, what harm are they doing? And how can we be people who participate in healing? So that to me is one of the crucial questions for our time, especially for people of faith. How can we participate in healing the wounds of our social divisions, the wounds that have happened recently and the wounds that go back for many generations? And the first thing I think we need to do is say, well, what would motivate us to participate in healing? Why would we do that? I think back to our uh, recently elected president, uh, Joe Biden, and he used the word healing, that we needed a time of healing in our nation. And that is true. That's true, I think, whether we're thinking about pandemic responses and making sure that people get vaccinated and have healing from disease. But it's also true, and I think President Biden was using this in this, uh, this word in this sense, it's also true in a larger sense that we need healing of our political divides. We need healing of our racial and ethnic divisions and the animosity and violence that we've seen among different groups of people throughout these recent years. And it is true that we can dig into our ideals as a nation and the concept of unity in order to look towards healing. But it's also true that we in the church have an even deeper calling to be participants in the healing love of God as God continues to work in the world. So I wanted to begin just by looking at a passage from the book of Ephesians. And I need to frame this a little bit. The book of Ephesians is a letter that we think Paul wrote uh, to a group of churches. It was meant to be a circulated letter. So it was meant to travel from church to church so that people across the region could read this. And there's some letters by Paul that are much more specific to a local context. This is a broader uh, letter about unity and about what it means to be united as the people of God, the newly formed people of God. And so Paul gets to the center of this book um, in Ephesians chapter three, and he writes, surely you have heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you. That is the mystery made known to me by revelation as I've already written briefly. In reading this, then you'll be able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to people in other generations as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to God's holy apostles and prophets. So just to translate that for a minute, Paul is basically saying God's been up to something for a long, long time. And it was a mystery for a long, long time. We, the Jewish people of God, didn't always understand what it was that God was doing. And right now, in this time, that mystery is being revealed. And then he gets to this uh, verse six, he says, this mystery is that through the gospel, the good news of Jesus, through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, and sharers together in the promise in Christ Jesus. When I first read this, I was a little bit confused because it's kind of this huge lead up. It's like a drum roll and we're about to get to the symbol clang. And the symbol clang is that the Gentiles get to be Christians. And as a Gentile who lives in a predominantly Gentile Christian context, so these are all non-Jewish people, I'm like, well, of course, right? I've known that for a long, long time. But in Paul's day, the primary social division was between Jew and Gentile. They could not worship together. They could not eat the same foods. They could not even really um, coexist in daily life because of living in such separate societies. And of course, you can imagine all of the stereotypes and animosities that therefore were created between Jew and Gentile. Uh, but what Paul is saying here is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs, not just even they're included as like second class citizens together with Israel, but actually heirs. They are ones who get to inherit all the riches of God's grace together with Israel. And you'll notice his language heirs together, members together, sharers together. There's such an emphasis on bringing these two previously irreconcilable groups of people together in Christ Jesus. So great 
we're really not in our country, although there still is certainly a serious problem of anti-Semitism, the major social divisions that we experience in our country are not typically what we would call Jew and Gentile. So what does this have to do with that? Well, it's clear from Paul's other writings that he cares about the ways in which the gospel overcomes and heals the wounds of social divisions, not just when it comes to Gentiles and Jews. But as he writes elsewhere, when it comes to male and female, when it comes to slave and free, he recognizes the way in which Jesus welcomes all of humanity into the family of God. And this is not by erasing our diversity or our differences or our cultural distinctions. It's not by making us all the same, but it is by uniting us through our common humanity in the family of God. And so what I want to talk about today is that we do live in a time of exclusion and division, and that harms all of us. I want to lay that out in brief at the beginning of this presentation, but then talk about how we, as the people of God, can participate in healing. And we'll come back to this passage from Ephesians a little bit later on as I talk. Let me begin by telling you a little bit of my own story. I grew up in a world of social advantage. This is a picture from my wedding day. I got married really young. I met my husband, Peter, when I was 16, and we dated for five and a half years and got married right after we graduated from college. And little did I know that I grew up in a world of social advantage because I grew up with married parents who were white, who were educated. They both have had college educations. My mom had a master's degree. Uh, I grew up with enough wealth to have stability, to have my parents be able to pay for my education when I needed them to. I grew up born in America as an American citizen with many generations before me as American citizens. And all of those things brought with them unearned social advantages, things I had not worked for, things I had not earned, and yet things that benefited me when, for example, I went uh, looking for a job because my name on a resume looked like a name that people uh, had certain associations with. They assumed certain things about my social status just by seeing my name. I had, again, a relative amount of wealth and stability that allowed my husband and me to go and get a mortgage on a house, even when we were very young and I was working for a nonprofit and so was he and we didn't have a ton of money. Um, we had a set of social advantages that we didn't recognize until six years into our marriage, we had our first baby, Penny. And you see Penny here on the left, that's just a few hours after she was born. And then on the right, that's when she was um, about one year old. Penny was diagnosed with Down syndrome two hours after she was born. And so Penny also was born into a set of social advantages, which I just described, whiteness and wealth and education and expectations and stability and married parents and being an American. But she also was born as a child with a set of physical and intellectual disabilities that disadvantaged her. And that's true as far as just, yes, any her genetic code meant that she's going to have to work harder at certain things, but it also meant she had a set of social disadvantages that really didn't have to do with what she could or could not accomplish in the world. It had to do with how people perceived her, whether that was how doctors perceived her as someone who was worthy of their care. Or in the case of, for example, when Penny was two years old, I uh, called up a preschool and talked to them about their program for two-year-olds and described that I had a daughter who was ready to be with other kids. I thought that would be really beneficial to her. We had a great conversation about the program that was on offer a couple mornings a week. And then I said, I should mention that my daughter has Down syndrome. And I could hear in the director of the preschool, I could hear her voice close. It was as if she had a door. And in our conversation, that door slammed in my face as soon as I said the words Down syndrome. And she said back to me, oh, we would have no place for her here. It was one of the first times in my life that I had experienced that type of rejection. Rejection based not upon an actual encounter with another human being, but based upon a category and a category of exclusion. Penny was born into a set and a history 
of exclusion and discrimination, which I'm sure many of you who are here because you have uh, disabilities yourselves or you have family members with disabilities or you're concerned about some of the ways in which our society is set up to create exclusion for people with disabilities. I'm sure some of you have experienced that as well. And I began to realize that it wasn't just Penny, it wasn't just children with disabilities who were excluded from those unearned social advantages that I had, but that there were all sorts of people on the margins. And I began to recognize what we now have come to call privilege, social privilege. And I think of social privilege as a set of unearned social advantages that are given to some and not to others. There's not often it's talked about in terms of white privilege. That's not all we're talking about. This is a Venn diagram. We could add more circles to it. It just gets tricky to draw Venn diagrams with lots of circles I have found. Um, but this is a Venn diagram with some of the ways in which our social situation is constructed. Whiteness is one set of advantages um, that comes with it, has one set of advantages that comes with it. Gender, of course, being uh, male for most of our history has brought with it advantages that women uh, have not had. Wealth, of course, offers advantages and access to opportunity, um, even in a country that we are supposedly meritocratic, but wealth still offers advantages. And ability, uh, you can think of that before there were what are called curb cuts which are the cuts in a sidewalk curb that allow for uh, wheelchairs and of course also strollers and bikes and scooters and all sorts of other wheeled uh, vehicles to go uh, easily to move from a sidewalk to a street and cross a street. So you can imagine what it was to be in a wheelchair before curb cuts were ubiquitous. It meant that you were literally incapable of navigating a cityscape. Whereas now that division has been erased. So we can see that as just a little example of the ways in which ability and disability can create a dividing line uh, that does not have to do with what we have earned. Family, whether your parents are married, what your family expectations are, the education of your family, all of those things are not things that you as an individual earned, but that were given to you or not given to you, that advantaged you or did not advantage you. And what I've discovered and learned over time and recognized over time is that because of human selfishness, because of human fear and anxiety, when one group of people has a set of unearned social advantages, it leads to unjust social divisions. Some of that comes out of ignorance, some of that comes out of pride, some of that comes out of a sense of fear and of needing to hoard the resources that I've been given. But regardless of where it comes from, I observed this in my daughter's life. I observed it in the world around me when it came to other people who did not have the same advantages that I had. And I began to recognize that social divisions harm. How exactly do social divisions do harm? There are three ways, and I want to talk about all three of these. Social divisions harm us through exclusion, and I've already talked a bit about that in terms of Penny's experience of exclusion, and I'm sure you've had experiences, whether that's in your own context or um, experiences that you've observed of people being excluded from opportunity, excluded from access. Uh, I gave that example of the wheelchair access, but we can see that in multiple different ways. There's also the harm of injustice. And especially for people who believe that we are all created in the image of God, when some people are valued as more um, highly than others, what we see is injustice at work. What we see is the priority that is given in scripture when God says, take care of the widows and the orphans, take care of the poor. What that translates into in our day is take care of the people on the margins. In fact, bring them into the center. And if you're not doing that, then you are participating in injustice. And for any of us who are in these positions of social advantage, we are much of the time without even meaning to participating in systems of injustice. The final way though that I have seen the harm of social division is not just in how that affects Penny, when Penny was first born and I saw that she had been excluded from opportunity and access, 
I was concerned about that. And at first I wanted to just bring her into my world. I wanted her to be able to be like me. And I started to have that same heart for other people who were on the margins. And I thought, I just want everyone to have the access and the opportunity that I have. And that seems like a great idea until I started to look at my own culture. When I started to look in at the culture that I was a part of, a world of whiteness and wealth and education and stability, all of those things together, what I began to see was the harm of isolation. And I want to pause here for a minute and explore this a little more deeply because I think this is so true and affects uh, so much of our society. We talk a lot about the ways in which social divisions harm us through exclusion and injustice. I think it's a little bit harder to see the ways in which social divisions harm those who, at least in theory, are benefiting from them. So I want to talk about a culture that I have learned in having Penny and other people with disabilities in my life, a culture that values productivity over people. Getting things done is more important in the world that I come from, a world of achievement and a world of success. Getting things done is more important than making sure that people are cared for. The intellect is valued more than interdependence. And so making sure that you can win an argument or prove a point is more important than saying, I need help. Can we be in relationship with one another? The individual is valued more than the community. And so individual needs can be placed in opposition to communal needs rather than in a dynamic of giving and receiving to one another. Competition is valued over compassion and collaboration. Invincibility is valued over vulnerability. So that sense of, I remember when Penny was first born, I thought about um, what it might be like if I were to meet Penny in heaven. And I realized that I wasn't sure whether Penny would have Down syndrome in heaven. And I'm still not sure what the answer is to that question or whether I'm even framing that question in a way that makes any sense of what heaven will be like. But I realized that I had always imagined myself in a heavenly sense as someone who would be perfected and i saw that as being some kind of superhero where i'd be able to run without stopping that i would be able to i mean essentially leap buildings in a single bound and i realized that i was seeing myself as someone who would be an isolated and invincible person cut off from god and community rather than recognizing that part of my humanity is that vulnerability, is that limitation and that sense of need. I also have come from a culture that values isolated achievement instead of mutual giving and receiving and that values control over love. If I look at the scriptures and I look at the depictions of Jesus and the descriptions of what it means to live in love, I do not see the values of productivity and intellect and individualism and competition and on down this list. As John Swinton, who is a disability theologian, has written, Jesus was a three mile per hour God. He walked at a pace of three miles per hour. I've seen when I look at my culture that when you look at statistics about people who live in whiteness and wealth and education, what you find is high rates of loneliness, depression, substance abuse, and despair. Being in a place of whiteness and wealth and stability does not, under our culture's values, lead to health and wholeness. It leads to loneliness and depression and despair. I read an article in the New York Times uh, that came out a couple of months ago and it was talking about how anthropologists mark the beginning of human society. And the researcher who was asking about it was surprised because they thought, okay, we'll mark human society by when writing was developed or when we can see problem solving, something that had to do with the intellect. And Margaret Mead, who's a famous anthropologist, said, we mark human society as um, developing when we found a gravesite that contained a femur, a bone, a leg bone, that had that demonstrated that it had been broken and had healed. In other words, a community member had broken their femur, which meant they would not be able to move with the community anymore. 
And instead of leaving that community member behind to die, in which case their body, their remains, if there had been any remains, would have been have shown a broken femur. Instead, the remains shown a healed femur. And it's that healing, that community that came around an individual and loved them enough that they were able to come back into health and wholeness. It is that that marks the beginning in anthropological terms of human society. Isn't that beautiful? And doesn't that speak to the humanity that God gives us? That ability to care for one another in the midst of brokenness and in the midst of vulnerability? All of these things, exclusion, injustice, isolation, affect all of us, those of us who are on the center of social advantage and those of us who are excluded from it, from it. which is why I've come to this conclusion, and I'll say it again, that social divisions harm all of us, not just those who are excluded, but also those who are theoretically advantaged or benefiting from it. And I began to ask, especially as a Christian, what does it mean for me to participate in healing. I've been studying Jesus's healing ministry in the gospels lately, and I was really struck by this one passage in John, uh, excuse me, Luke chapter seven, in which John the Baptist sends his disciples to Jesus to say, are you the one who was to come? Are you really the Messiah? Because I'm not so sure John the Baptist at this point is in jail. And Jesus makes, gives him a list of things that he's done. And he lists healing the sick, helping the blind to see, giving the deaf the ears to hear. He lists five different ways in which he has healed people. And then he says, and the good news is preached to the poor. So he says, how do you know that I'm the Messiah? Healing, 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 and a little bit of preaching. And I think that's instructive to us as the church, that we too are meant to be a part of a ministry of healing. And at first that easily sounds like what we're supposed to be doing is Shazam miracles in which people's physical illnesses and injuries are transformed. At first that's what it looks like for Jesus to have a ministry of healing. But as we delve more closely into these stories, what we see is that Jesus is doing so much more than physical transformation. He's forgiving people, so he's giving them a healing back to God, a connection to God. But he's also doing a social work of healing. He is returning people who have been outcast from their families and communities. He is returning them to the synagogue. He's returning them to the streets. He's returning them to the marketplace. He's returning them to their homes. Jesus's healing ministry is a ministry of healing from pain. It is also a ministry of healing for the social fabric that has been torn. When we talk about a healing ministry within our churches, I believe what that can also be called is a ministry of creating communities of belonging. I think about our spaces, and this can be true in a church community or a school community or a town. What would it mean for our spaces to become places of belonging? And of asking the question, who belongs here? Um, and being satisfied with the family of God as our answer. Many of us in our society and in our churches, uh, at some point or another in our history, have had communities of exclusion. We see that really writ large in our country when we had segregation laws, whether that was in schools or in workplaces. Um, but we also have seen that in terms of uh, people with disabilities being sent to institutions or families who've been asked not to come back to churches because their uh, family member was too disruptive. We've also seen a move towards tolerance in which you're welcome to be here, but make sure that if you're too loud, you get out. Make sure that you behave according to our terms. And then I would say in recent years, many communities have wanted to be communities of inclusion. And that's a beautiful thing. Many communities have said, we want to have a ministry in which those who are on the outside are welcomed in. But often that experience of inclusion is come and be like us, rather than a sense of mutual giving and receiving. And we wanna move from inclusion to belonging to a sense that we would not be us without you. 
Not just a sense of, oh, you are on the fringes and we want to welcome you in, but rather you are a part of the group that welcomes me. You are a part of what makes us who we are. So I wanna talk about what it looks like to become places of belonging, what it looks like to become uh, and participate in Jesus's healing ministry. There are three ways we can think about this. Use our heads, our hearts, and our hands. And I wanna begin with this idea of using your head, although it is not necessarily a one, two, three action. Um, these things can all happen simultaneously or in the opposite order. Um, but the point is that there's a holistic approach to becoming participate, participants in healing and communities of belonging. The first way to think about this is to use your head and to say, okay, what is the concern or the problem that I want to address? I'm thinking right now institutionally, if you are a part of a parachurch organization, if you're a part of a church ministry, even if you're thinking about a town or a school, what, what, in what ways are there still social divisions? What do I want to learn? What problem do I want to address? And so you're asking questions. If you're a church, for example, you might say, if you're thinking about why are there no people with disabilities in our sanctuary? You might ask that question. If 20% of the population experiences some form of disability and there aren't any in your sanctuary, that probably says more about who belongs there than it does about your local population. What has the history in your church been of incorporating or including people with disabilities? Who is up front uh, on a given Sunday? Who's in leadership? Who is welcome there? Does your church comply with Americans with Disabilities Act? Who's on the walls? Who is honored in your church? Ask questions about who you have been and who you are right now. Do some research. Learn what's going on locally and globally among the community that you're thinking about. What do you need to understand about the present? What do you need to understand about the past? What is the current demographic reality in your town? Who is moving? Who's not? Who's nearby? When you're doing some of that past work, I just want to emphasize that it's important to both honor and critique and not simply to look back and chastise or uh, castigate the people who have come before us, but also to say thank you for the work that they've done. And finally, in using your head, it's important to read and research and talk to people from diverse perspectives. So asking people, what has your experience been in our church community? What has been challenging? What has been a blessing? What has worked for you? After doing the work or while doing the work of using your head, we also, of course, need to use our hearts. We don't just connect intellectually. If we do that, we often um, will end up steamrolling people because we're not connected to real needs and we're not engaging from a prayerful place of humility. I want to bring us back to Ephesians chapter three for a minute. When I think about using the heart, I think about that heart going in two directions. One is vertical in our relationship with God, because we need to be equipped and empowered by the love of God if we are to do the work of Jesus in our world. And so what does it look like? What practices can we implement in order to be connected spiritually? And then we'll move to this in a minute. There's a horizontal aspect of using our heart in which we connect to other people in relationship. So this prayer is from Paul's prayer in Ephesians 3. I read the beginning of this passage earlier in which Paul shares the exciting mystery of the gospel that Jesus intends to bring everyone into his family. And then Paul writes, for this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth takes its name. I pray that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant that you be strengthened in your inner being with power through his spirit and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, through faith as you are being rooted and grounded in love. The most important way for us to become communities of belonging is for us to be rooted and grounded in love. 
There are questions we can ask, as I just said, about ADA compliance. There are questions we can ask about our history. There are ways in which we can critique our ability to care for people who are on the margins. And there's social justice causes that we can sign up for, but if we are not rooted and grounded in love, then that will come out of a sense of self-righteousness. We will burn out. Uh, we will not actually care for people. So the first thing we need to do in order to have our hearts engaged here is to receive God's love. There are many ways in which we can receive God's love. It can be from accepting the care and kindness of someone else because God works through people. It can be through taking the Eucharist. It can be through giving actually an act of love to someone else because so often that's where we are understanding God's love at work. And it can be contemplative prayer of sitting and living with passages like 1 Corinthians 13, 1 John chapter 4, in which we soak in the truth of what it means to be God's beloved. There are other practices that can enable us and equip us and empower us to be becoming communities of belonging. Practices of lament and confession, especially if you've done some work that has exposed history that is hard to reckon with the history of race relations in your church community or of the ways people with disabilities have been treated or other peoples on the margin. Practicing lament over the state of our broader culture when it comes to injustices and confession. We have been given a way to bring to God that which is broken and ask for forgiveness. And finally, we can also connect and be empowered and equipped by understanding biblical healing understanding what it is that God wants to heal, which has so much to do with our human relationships and our relationship to him and how we can be a part of that. The other way in which we can use our hearts is to connect horizontally. So we can connect through friendships, we can connect through mentors. These are relationships in which ideally we would know on a heart level people who are different than we are. That might, again, be encountering someone who is not, does not have the same intellectual ability, does not have the same physical abilities, does not have the same racial or ethnic background, not in order to use that person for your own uh, sense of learning and, and information, but actually so that you can have a mutual exchange of giving and receiving, of understanding who we are, what it means to be human, and what it means to follow God together. And then we come back to this question, who belongs here? And how do we communicate that? I uh, am a part of a church in a little local town. So we are less than hundred people and uh, we are not required to be ADA compliant. And I happened to notice that we had some elderly members of our congregation who were struggling to get in the front door. We have two little steps into our sanctuary, but they were struggling to get in because they walked with canes or just walked somewhat unsteadily. And they were driving around to the back door of the church, which was a convoluted way to get into the sanctuary. And so I brought it up with our church council and I said, I think we need a little ramp. Uh, and so we dutifully, as a church council, even though we were not legally required to do so, created a ramp. And then we got, you know, a couple months down the road and I look at Edie and Edie is still struggling to make her way up the steps. And I said, Edie, we built a ramp for you. Like, why aren't you using the ramp? And she said, because you didn't put a railing in. And here was a very well-intentioned person, me, um, with all the information I've got about people with disabilities and all the learning I've done, I bring the proposal to the council, we do the work, but I hadn't actually spoken with Edie or Dolly or any of the other people who are struggling to get into the sanctuary to see they didn't just need a ramp, they needed a railing. And of course, we immediately responded by building a railing. And now Dolly and Edie are able to get into the sanctuary, but it's just an indication of, again, the place of relationships, of knowing what is your experience and how can we serve you in that? We want to be able to begin to receive the giftedness of all our members, old and young, able and disabled, 
white and black, rich and poor, whatever those social lines are, everyone who comes into our church communities are people who have been brought there with needs that we can try to uh, understand and have compassion for and respond to. And everyone has been brought there with gifts that we are invited to receive for the glory of God and for the healing of our body. And then finally, we use our hands. We put these things into action and we do that in a couple of different ways. In individual ways, right? We might change just our own perspective, our own practices of welcome and of hospitality, who we speak to at coffee hour, what it means to invite someone to church. But we also look at our areas of influence and our institutional uh, scope as well. Institutions are the hardest to change, and I'm thinking about entire systems, whether that's the system of a, a town or a school or a state or a country, those take a lot of work and usually any one individual is not going to be able to change things. Um, so, for example, something like the Americans with Disabilities Act was a groundswell of individual and influential change that eventually made it to an institutional level because there were people in power who were able to affect that change. But I want to um, give one example of an area in which I would say someone used their influence to participate in social healing. And some of you may know about Friendship House. This is a, a picture of the first Friendship House, which was created in Holland, Michigan at Western Seminary. And I had a chance to visit Friendship House and I've written some articles about them and just interviewed um, their founder, Matt Floating. And so I learned that what where this came from is that Matt Floating was at a, having a problem uh, finding housing for all of his seminarians. He was not thinking about healing social divisions but he was thinking about the abundant nature of God and about how one person's needs are often a way in which God wants to use someone else's gifts. And so he was at church and he was thinking about this problem he had with not being able to fill, uh, not being able to uh, find spots for all of his seminarians to live. And he ran into a couple who were friends of his who had an adult son with Down syndrome. And they were just talking about their life. And they said, yeah, the thing we're working on, our son uh, really is at a time in his life where he's ready to live semi-independently. He's not ready to live independently, but he's ready to live semi-independently. And we're not sure what to do about that. We want to give that to him, but we don't know how. And Matt started thinking. And he thought, I wonder if we've got two different needs. I have a need for housing and they have a need for housing, but they're kind of different needs. He thought, but gosh, my seminarians need to know the people they're going to be ministering to. And many of them have had no experience with people with disabilities. And these adults in our community who have intellectual disabilities need the chance to learn how to live independently. What if there's a way in which the gifts and needs of these different groups of people might serve one another? And out of this friendship house was born. It's a place where seminarians go and live alongside adults with disabilities and they learn and grow and befriend one another. The blessings that that has brought to individuals and to the communities and then to other communities where new friendship houses have begun and then to these ongoing ministries of these young men and women who are going out having had this experience as a part of their seminary education, you can, you can imagine uh, what that has done to participate in their own personal healing as well as in the healing of wider communities. And so I come to the end of my presentation today with a couple of questions for you to ask yourself and to ask within your community, what do you wanna learn? When it comes to social divisions, what do you need to learn? Is it from the past? Is it from the present? Is it local? Is it global? What do you need to learn? And how do you wanna connect? What spiritual practices might you need to put in place in order to be equipped to do the work of healing in your own life and in your community? What people do you want to befriend or get to know in a deeper way in order to participate in healing? And then finally, what next step is God calling you to take? 
There's a beautiful book called Reconciling All Things. It came out of the Duke Center for Reconciliation. And in it, Chris Rice and Emmanuel Katangole are writing and they say, you know, we want the work of reconciliation which in some way is a word for this healing of social divisions. We want the work of reconciliation to be innocent. We want it to be fast and we want it to be global, to happen everywhere all at once. But in reality, it is messy, it is slow, and it is small and local. And so I hope that actually comes as an encouragement that we are all called to the slow, small, messy work of healing in our own little churches, our own little communities, our own little lives, and that that all gets to be a part of this bigger and even more beautiful and comprehensive work of healing that God wants to do. It has been a great, great gift to me to recognize the social divisions that I was born into and participated in without even knowing it to recognize even the ugliness of those things and to acknowledge them. In some times, cases uh, need to repent of them. And then to say, what does it mean for me to get to be a part of God's healing work in my own life and in my community? I am incredibly grateful that my life is not about allowing people like my daughter Penny to become like me, <laughs> but that instead is about humbling myself and recognizing the great gift it is if I could learn a little bit more from her. I hope that this has at least given you some things to think about when you think about your own communities and the ways in which you might be able to bring a healing message um, back home. I will just end by saying there are resources on my website about all of these things. Um, this right here, Head, Heart, Hands, you just heard me talk about that. I have a free ebook. It's in both ebook and audiobook form on my website that you can find on the resources page. So if you'd like that as a free download, please, um, I'd love for you to take it. I also have um, a podcast that's about the concept of social divisions and healing social divisions. So I would certainly love to invite you to join me there as well. Thanks so much for being here. And I'm going to turn it back over to Jean uh, to see if there are any questions. Thank you. Okay, we have a lot of really good questions. Um, where to begin? I think I'll begin with the comments. Okay. Um, there were some comments that uh, mental illness and dementia uh, are also disabilities, should be recognized as disabilities. Um, someone asked, Susan asked, in your culture that values, mm -hmm. you list uh, competition over compassion, that our culture uh, values competition over compassion. Um, how does competition over collaboration fit into this? To me, collaboration, uh, working towards restorative justice is so important. Yeah, that's, I think that's a distinction we could add to the list. Um, and, and certainly, we have so many examples of people who are working collaboratively and who are understanding the values of compassion. Um, and yet, I also think that if we look at what is um, highly valued both monetarily and in terms of acclaim in our culture, it tends to be that individual competitive achievement. Uh, and I think that at least watching my kids in school, there is more of an emphasis on collaboration uh, than there was, I think, when I was in school. So uh, I don't know if that's just our individual schools or if that's actually something that we're starting to recognize as a broader culture. I would certainly hope so. Um, and I think that there are ways in which we can choose to step back, listen. I mean, again, there's a lot of scripture to be quick to listen, right? Um, and to humble ourselves and to say, what do I have to receive here? And not just what do I have to offer? Um, and certainly not seeing things in terms of winning and losing, but in terms of that a sense of abundance, right? Um, if Matt Floating had said, gosh, you need housing and I need housing, I'm gonna start rushing so that I can get the housing first, it would be a very different story than, huh, 
what if God is an abundant God and we can bless one another in these needs? So I uh, just want to affirm that distinction between competition and collaboration um, and say that, yes, this is uh, really important as far as justice concerns, um, as well as just the participating and receiving the blessings that I believe God wants for our communities. So Eric asks, how do we include those whose disruption is to attack the pastors and others around them? How do self-care and self-preservation intersect with inclusion? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think, of course, any of these situations are probably going to be local in their address, you know, like what to do in that specific situation is not something I'm probably equipped to answer without more context. And yet it does seem to me that um, having honest conversations, okay, so what is the need here of someone who is being disruptive or yelling in a service? What need is not being met? Or how could we come around this person and try to understand better what's going on. And if sometimes you have people with disabilities who are not able to speak verbally on their own behalf, uh, sometimes you are. So let's have, it, what's the setting in which we're gonna feel the most comfortable? Who are the people who can be there and who can help the most? And all of this takes time. I mean, that's the slow and messy part, right? That um, we are often just rushing forward and it's like, oh shoot, I forgot to have that conversation and it's gonna happen again. Um, so there is a sense of let's take time together and let's build the supports in order to welcome this person. And yet, you're right, we have to be taking care of ourselves, protecting our pastors, um, not from, you know, protecting them in the sense of they need uh, to be treated with kid gloves, but protecting them in the sense that they've got a hard job and uh, it, is, it is a tricky situation. So I think that's where the role of elder, elders and of ushers and of people who, again, can, instead of saying, hey, you're kicked out, we don't want you here, can say, how can we create a space of belonging for you that is also a space of belonging for everyone else who is here? Maybe that person can't understand something uh, through audibly or visually that's going on. Um, again, back to the idea of who belongs here. If everything is in small print or assumes literacy, well, then who belongs here? Uh, people with a certain type of eyesight and people with a certain type of intelligence. So asking those types of questions might be able to surface um, an issue that you didn't even know was going on. But again, I'm sorry, I can't speak real specifically to that uh, situation. So I'm going to mush a couple of comments and questions together because I think they kind of go together. Okay. Um, Cindy Weber said, more a place of belonging than inclusion. Reflective listening helps. And then Laura Stone said, conversations and decisions with rather than about or for folks with disabilities, all kinds of people on the edges are so important. Then Susan Smith says, in the culture that Val, oh no, whoops, sorry. How can you get people on the fringes not participating now, but have in the past? and or our family members of parishioners that are not using their gifts to feel empowered to do so. And there was one more, hmm. let me find it. How do you combat the I'm just one person with no power or influence kind of thinking? I thought those four things went together. It's a lot. All I right, know. so I'm gonna try to remember. I do think that first comment about listening with um, and talking with rather than about might be a guiding um, frame for some of those other questions. Because I, uh, for example, this week at Penny's school, we're doing something called a PATH meeting, which is as opposed to the individualized education plan where we set out these educational goals, the PATH meeting is saying, who do you, where do you wanna be in five years? And what can we do as a community to support you? So her teachers are there, but they also invite family members and even like her dance teacher or her 
uh, youth minister actually will be attending this meeting so that everybody can say, what would it mean for us to support you in your dreams and your goals? How can we focus on what is um, empowering and exciting for you uh, rather than on your deficits, which sometimes is what an individualized education plan is like, oh, you're not able to do this. So let's, let's help you out. And I think that churches might um, think that way as well in terms of that sense of, yeah, let's talk with instead of about. So the person who's on the fringes of course, you may have a situation in which they're not willing to talk. Um, and But finding out, hey, where have you been? We've missed you. We don't want to put any guilt on you, but we do know that we miss you. We miss your gifts. We want to know how we could um, welcome you back if that's something that you'd like. Having those conversations is certainly a simple, um, if also challenging, first step. Um, and then I think for anyone who feels like they don't have power, I would actually push back on prayer for that because I think that, um, and, and specifically this prayer from Ephesians 3, the word power um, is written in that prayer three times and the word love comes three times. And so it is this prayer that we would be empowered by the Holy Spirit. So not by our social status and our social position, but actually by the power of the Holy Spirit. And I believe God wants us to have other people to not be alone in our positions of power or of powerlessness, honestly. And so that would be my first response there would be, um, what would it mean to pray for other people with a like-hearted concern um, and connect to those people? And what would it mean to rely on the power of the Holy Spirit to break through uh, with love because again, the Holy Spirit doesn't break through by like kicking people off the team and nudging people out of the way, but with love uh, to actually be a part of healing. I'm not sure if that answers that question, um, but that's at least what I heard. Thank you. And thank you so much, Amy Julia, for being willing to share with us and answer questions. So grateful uh, for your words today. Well, it's great to be here. Thank you for having me. Um, and yeah, please feel free, anyone, you're welcome to follow up with me. Um, if you want to, through email, there's a contact form on my website or through um, social media or whatever. So we have other good questions, but unfortunately, we're at the end of our time. So uh, we're going to stop here for anybody that needs to leave. Stan has a few announcements. If you want to stay on after those announcements, uh, you are welcome to do so. Amy Julia has graciously said that she will stay on to chat for a little while with us. So thank you everyone for attending. We're really glad that you were here. Uh, you can find more information again about Amy Julia and her work at her uh, website, amyjuliabecker.com. And uh, you can follow her blog and find her on social media as well and follow her there. So thanks everyone. Ian. Thank you, Amy, Julia, and uh, Jean for this wonderful session. And uh, we're grateful that uh, for everyone that had an opportunity uh, to set aside an hour or so this afternoon to participate in this webinar. I've just posted the link uh, for the CEU request form, and uh, you can click on that. That will take you to the uh, online form, fill it out and uh, hit submit. And uh, we will have those processed uh, as soon as possible. And of course, you'll receive your CEU certificate uh, from uh, Brethren Academy uh, as a PDF uh, by email. Also, if you have questions or you have some difficulties with that page, uh, just send me an email. And I listed my uh, email address at sduick at brethren.com. Again, Amy, Julia, it was terrific having you here. And uh, I hope maybe we can set up another one uh, sometime sure. in the future. And uh, for Jean for hosting this. And I'm going to go off and uh, we'll keep this page, at, this site active for anyone that wants to stick around and uh, continue to engage with her. All right, thank you. So Amy, Julie, if it's okay, I'm going to uh, ask a few more of the questions that popped yeah, up sure. in the chat. I think this is an important one. Um, uh, Larry, that uh, was Ron once, said, many whites uh, are poor and resent being called privileged. Mm -hmm. What do you say concerning this difference because of green or money? Why can't we just treat people uh, uh, as one race created by God? And he said, you did answer 
much of that. Thank you. And then someone else uh, typed in something similar. In a similar question, the Andrew Wenger said, in a similar question, being a generally solidly white middle-class congregation in a white neighborhood that is struggling with poverty. Mm. Yeah, so I think that's why the Venn diagram is helpful to me. And um, sometimes I do a teaching that actually goes for a lot longer about that point. Um, in order to demonstrate, so for example, one of my best friends uh, is named, her name is Nero Feliciano. She, her, uh, she's brown skinned. And so she has experienced some of the prejudice that comes in our country from not being white. She also would say, I am absolutely a person of privilege. I have married parents who are doctors and who are able to pay for my education. So the amount of like stability and wealth and all the things I talked about, like she has privilege in those ways. She does not have white privilege. So that's just a little anecdote. My daughter Penny being another example of someone who has aspects of privilege in one area and not in another. And so I think what happens so often in our national dialogue is we only are talking about white privilege, which is a real thing. And again, I could give you statistic after statistic to demonstrate that simply having a white sounding name is an advantage in a job interview process uh, when people are looking at resumes and not seeing anything else just the name on the piece of paper can be an advantage we social scientists have found but having white privilege does not mean i have an easy life or that somebody else who is not white might not have other types of privilege that give them advantages so it's a more complicated issue than we often see um, and the lack of compassion that people have for each other in this area is part of what also leads to division. So I think that for us in our church churches to be able to recognize two things. One, to be able to recognize what you were saying in that sense of common humanity, that we actually do have something that holds us together in being created in the image of God. We do have our common vulnerabilities, limitations, and needs. We have our common brokenness and sinfulness, and we also have our common giftedness and belovedness that we have to offer. But if we try to flatten everybody out as if we're all the same, then we lose some of the beauty uh, and some of the real injustices that certain groups are experiencing. So we want to hold on to the distinctiveness of different cultures. We want to celebrate the fact that we've got people who look different and who have different cultural backgrounds. We want to learn from each other in those things. We also want to lament the fact that there are whole groups of people who are treated differently and badly simply because of whatever identity marker. And so that's where I think we want to hold together a common humanity without losing difference, but instead as a way to celebrate and lament some of the injustice around our differences. I hope that's helpful um, to those questions. Uh, someone asked, what was the name of the book that you mentioned from Duke? Reconciling All Things. Reconciling uh, All Things. I think it's Chris Rice and Emmanuel Catangole who wrote it. Someone said, as a person with a disability who serves people with disabilities, Laura Stone said, I so appreciate the ways you articulate and organize this information. Oh, thank you. That's great to hear. Um, I, I also, I will mention that um, I had the sweet gift of an opportunity to write um, an article, which ended up being the cover story for Christianity Today. It was in April, maybe of 2018, um, called the ministry of the disabled. Um, there was a sense of being, what was exciting about it, and I wrote about Friendship House as well as some other ministries there, was the ability to say, in what way do people with disabilities have ministries and particular gifts to offer to their congregation? So for any of you who just might want to read more and think more about that, that was really great to, uh, to write. And I got to interview people who have lived in Friendship House and, um, and write more about that. So I'll just offer that as something you could look up. Hannah Thompson says, I am physically disabled and I see my vulnerabilities as strengths because I live in a world of interconnectedness. I believe in my theology of vulnerability is strength. I would say my community understands my strengths, 
but do I help other communities see strength in vulnerability? So I think it depends on whether people have eyes to see. And I actually think Jesus talks a lot about this. Um, his interaction with the man who was born blind. Uh, on the one hand, yes, this man was born blind and he is given physical sight by Jesus. But there's a sense in which in that story, he, the one who cannot physically see, sees more than all the teachers of the law. Because the teachers of the law don't know that there might be something that they cannot see without help. And so there's a sense in which, again, his vulnerability is his strength. It's this ability to even understand himself. And I, I feel like that has been true for many people with disabilities that I encounter, that they understand their humanity in a much more intuitive way than I do, because our culture has told me, and you know, I have <laughs> learned that they're wrong, that I'm invincible, and that vulnerability is bad. Um, and so I try to cover it up. So I certainly think that is true, and yet I'm, I'm not sure that everyone will be able to see it that way. I remember even walking down the street with my daughter Marilee once, this was a couple of years ago, and she saw someone in a wheelchair who was just talking to a friend and wheeling along the sidewalk. And she looked up at me and she said, oh, mom, that's sad. And she clearly thought I was going to say, oh, you're so sweet. And I was like, what do you mean that's sad? Like I was taken aback. And she's like, well, he's in a wheelchair. And I was like, but sweetie, what do you see when you look at that man and his friend who are moving down the street together that makes you think there's something sad going on? And we had this interaction and my daughter wears glasses. And so I talked to her about how no one looks at her face and says, oh, that's sad. She can't see. They say, I mean, if they say anything at all, it's, isn't that cool that her glasses enable her to see, right? And, and so I do think a framing of how we understand, do we understand someone to suffer from Down syndrome? I certainly don't see my daughter suffering from Down syndrome, but that's the language that's used often. Do we see someone who is confined to a wheelchair or who is using a wheelchair to be able to get around? How great is that? You know, so, and again, not to be overly Pollyannish about the fact that it can still be quite inconvenient in various places to have to try to navigate in a wheelchair, but um, I do want to emphasize the fact that a lot of this has to do with how we see. And certainly as a person with a disability, you can participate in helping people um, to understand that you do not need pity. <laughs> uh, and that in fact, there's a gift that can come in that self-understanding and that you can bless other people with that. I'm just scrolling through here, lots of thanks and appreciation. If I could step in, uh, one question was asked that came through on Q and A was if your family had been, if your family member had been queer, would that have changed your presentation in any way? Well, I don't think I can answer that definitively. My hope would be that what I have learned about. Well, what I talked about today was mostly disability in white picket fences. I'm also writing about the racial and ethnic divisions um, that I have come to understand differently. I hope that the principles or ideas of belonging would uh, be applicable across these different identity markers. I have not had, although I certainly have friends who identify um, as gay and lesbian, I do not have personal experience with a child who came out or a sibling or you know, a family member that's so close and intimate to me. And I, so as a result, I haven't done as much of that work. And so I can't speak exactly to that, but my hope would nevertheless be that our understanding again of that common humanity and of the ways in which God is present in vulnerability in brokenness and how God gifts and um, calls beloved to all of us. I hope that would help frame any of the thinking and conversations we have around any of these identity issues. Thank you. That's not an easy one to, to respond to. Well, but it's one that a lot of us I hope are wanting to respond to with grace and compassion, even when we don't exactly know how. So I hope that's a little bit helpful at least. 
Well, thank you everyone for your good questions. And thank you, Amy, Julia, for being willing to stay on a little bit longer sure. and chat with us. Really appreciate our time together um, and thank all of the wisdom you have to share with us. My pleasure. Thank you all for being here. And again, feel free um, to reach out. Until we meet again. Okay, thank you.